Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Emory Pharma Guest Speaker Series. So my name is Janet Liu. I am the Director of Biology here at Emory Pharma. We are a contract research company, and we service a lot of early stage uh, pharmaceutical development for both small molecule and large molecule drugs. And we're joined today by our speaker, Dr. Sarah Gleckstein. Uh, she is a senior early stage clinical scientist from Genentech. Her area of focus includes early clinical trials aimed at respiratory and fibrotic indications. She got her PhD from Cornell University in neurobiology. And before she joined Genentech, she spent a decade working as a medical writer and as a strategist, um, and she also held uh, faculty positions at Cornell at, at Com Columbia University. So without further ado, we'll look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Janet. All right, so really thank you again for having me, and I'm, you know, to have you guys here on a Friday afternoon interested is really, it's a statement about your company, which is, is pretty awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about early clinical development, and we work a lot with, with companies like yours in sort of executing these trials, but I work on the clinical side. And um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is sort of what's our overall strategy in approaching clinical development of a drug, uh, how do we design a clinical trial, and really what we see are the gaps and what we need to do in the future to, to do this even better than we do now. And so let's start with strategy and clinical development. And so you guys all know this, you've probably seen the funnel, right? Clinical development is lengthy, expensive, and it's risky. And so it can take like 10 years to get from your phase one to your approved drug, usually more. It can be expensive, 2.6 billion is an average. Uh, most drugs are gonna fail. Um, only about 12% entering into the first in human trial actually make it to be ultimately approved. And when I started in clinical development, I thought, well, if you make it through phase one, you're like partway there, you're a third of the way there. You just, and that's not the case, right? If you can make it through phase one, there's no guarantee you're gonna continue. Um, even if you make it through phase two, unfortunately. And so I just put up, this is um, one analysis, and I'm not sure of exactly how they did their modeling, but it's just showing you that the overall chance of success is so low when you consider any one sort of gate from phase one to phase two or phase two to phase three. And it really varies by the type of disease you're going after, and it's pretty dismal. Um, but the importance is it's a lot of unmet need out there. And so when we um, have a new drug coming into early clinical development, we really need to define the strategic concept, context and the target product profile. And that happens from the get-go, right out of the gate. And so the strategic context is the foundation for clinical development, and we uh, really have a vision for, the, for what this drug is, is going to be. Is it gonna be the best in disease, first in class? Uh, what is the differentiator from the standard of care or from the competition that is worth all of this time and investment and this high likelihood of failure? And we have a core strategy we, we consider uh, what's the entire standard of care for that indication and the competition? Um, are there additional indications? You know, really, how do we sequence these in our uh, clinical development plan? And what are other features that might be required in order to use this drug in the clinic or might be advantageous based on this uh, molecule? Is there a companion diagnostic or a specific segment of the population? Um, is there something we really want to see listed in the drug label so that the drug is used in a, in a very specific way? And so the target product profile, I don't know if, if all of you have ever seen one of these, most of you have. Um, we really define what we want that drug to look like on paper. And uh, we speak about the indication, so what's the disease area, but within that indication, what's the patient segment? Do they have a specific genotype? Do they have a specific... Um, uh, physiological parameter that would qualify them for use of this drug. Uh, for efficacy, um, we really want to pick out approvable endpoints, but also those um, we want to understand what bar we have to reach to be better than competition or standard of care. What's going to really improve patients' lives? Uh, safety, we want it to have an acceptable safety profile. 
Um, we really think about risk benefit. That's one of the major discussions we have in terms of safety and tolerability. We also think about our competitors or standard of care. If we have a drug that's just as efficacious but ha has a reduced patient burden, that's definitely a benefit to patients. And um, that might be you know, the strategy where we're aiming for strategically. Um, in terms of dose, we have to think about the formulation, the strengths and the frequency. If we have a drug that's oral and it's these big horse pills and it's for pediatric indication, you know, that'd be problematic. And so our TPP would, defi would define what dosing would be appropriate for that population. Um, we talk about route of administration and other sort of um, variables like health care measures. Um, and market access, what sort of features might this drug offer? And so we define what is the minimal profile, and that's a viable profile. But, you know, it's like if it just got that, you know, okay, that would make it viable. But we also define an acceptable and an aspirational, and that helps us with, with making key decisions on how to develop that drug. Um, and we use this as a way to really hone in on where are gaps and really make sure we're always sort of getting to where we want to be ultimately. And so we also, very early in development, we, it's like a game of chess. We form the clinical development plan. So when we start in phase one, we sort of project um, how we're going to get to phase three. And we don't just consider our drug. We consider you know, any other drugs that might be with Genentech's a large company. Um, so we consider what other drugs, when are they going to read out? How's, how's that going to inform decision making? But also external data. When are our key competitors reading out, and how is that going to impact our investment? Um, and you know, when to sequence in additional indications? Um, and you really are kind of having a lot of these gates, and you think about them advan in advance, so you know exactly when you're going to want to trigger that switch or make that change. And um, there's a lot of, at a company like Genentech, there's a lot of people involved, even at smaller companies, you have people with many different types of expertise to track what's going on externally, to really understand how to design these trials to be efficient and quick. And so let's move on to cl clinical trial design. Um, and so in early clinical development, what we're moving towards is uncertainty to more confidence in our understanding, our data. So that's all across development. But in early clinical, we're kind of in this middle region where we're like going from uncertainty into a little bit of confidence. And early clinical encompasses phase one and phase two trials. Phase one trials are safety studies, um, usually not a lot of patients. Phase two trials have more patients, still not like a huge number of patients. And they're really designed to see if there's any activity or efficacy and to understand the dose. And so when we're designing these trials to move into that area of confidence, um, there are many things we have to consider. One is the primary objective. And that is really, um, that might change depending on the type of trial. And we'll talk a little more about that, whether it's an FDA approvable endpoint or it's uh, you know, something we're doing just to understand a little more about the, the drug and its activity. Uh, study population is a healthy volunteer, is it patients? Um, are we enriching for any specific feature among these patients? Um, what's the number of subjects? How are we gonna randomize them? Uh, is this a controlled study? Are we blinding? Uh, what are the doses? Is, are we testing a dose range? Is there an exposure cap we need to consider? Um, group design, is this a parallel study or a sequential study or crossover? You know, are patients coming in and being set into arms or do they change throughout the study? How flexible do we want the study to be? And then our endpoints again, um, our primary, secondary, what are our key endpoints? What is the health authority guidance for that indication? Um, what is going to be most feasible and efficient to run? Which is a big question. What is the required safety data and monitoring required for this trial? What is our desired label? Are we developing a companion diagnostic? And there's some difference, differences between biologics and small molecules um, in terms of how you think about all of these designs. Some, one of the main ones is um, whether or not you need a food effect cohort, which you need for oral drugs, or do you need to test for anti-drug antibodies, which are uh, really critical for biologics. Um, and so at all levels, when we consider the study population, it's really a risk benefit question. Um, in development, you're exposing patients to some unknowns. And so um, there are questions the patient is gonna, decisions the patient's gonna be making about, be about benefit risks. And ultimately, 
when you're seeking approval, um, providers and the FDA will be making similar calculations based on you know, individual patients or groups of patients or the whole population. And one of the first questions we face is patients are healthy volunteers. And um, it really depends on the drug and on your intent. Um, but you really have to make sure the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, so phase ones for drugs being tested or um, developed for chronic diseases, oftentimes we use healthy volunteers because they should be safe enough to, to test on a healthy volunteer. Um, whereas drugs for cancer, which are often toxins, you don't wanna put a, a healthy volunteer in a trial like that. Um, but there's some cases when our drugs meant for chronic indications, uh, they, it's a, too risky for a healthy volunteer. In terms of the indication, um, you typically have some preclinical data that is gonna direct you, but nowadays we have these drugs which might have benefit in a wide variety of indications. And so you'll also consider what is gonna be the most feasible, how would you sequence these, and where is the unmet need? In terms of eligibility, what will allow for the best evaluation of the primary objective? What is the least restrictive label? And so you really try to have a broad of, of a patient population as possible in the trials. And you try to balance the experiment you wanna run with, um, to test the hypothesis with what's the opportunity for patients. And you, know, you, de you determine the number of subjects. And for those of you trained as scientists, you'll be shocked to know that we don't always enroll enough subjects to run the best experiment. Um, and so, you know, these are all questions that we have to determine. In terms of dose, you know, we really have to understand the PKPD, um, the therapeutic index, which is that range between when you have a therapeutic effect and a toxic effect of your drug over a range of doses. And you wanna understand like what, are the, what, are, what doses can, if there is an adverse event, can we monitor and mitigate for any, any um, safety issue? And there's often, you have to think about your, your do dosing objective in an oncology drug. You often want to go for MTD or the maximum dose a patient can take. But um, for some indications, maybe you just want partial inhibition over time. That would be your objective. And so you really look for benchmarks from, similar, from molecules that are similar sometimes to understand what's your dosing range you want. And you oftentimes dose sentinels to... Um, uh, you know, sort of check your, what you're doing. In terms of biomarker strategy, we really want to understand two things. What is target engagement and what is target modulation of the pharmacodynamic effect? And um, so we have data from our preclinical work, but you don't know if that drug is inert. That's always a concern when you do these trials. So we want to know that the target's engaged and that we're seeing an activity readout of some sort. Um, our trials are too small to really see efficacy a lot of times in phase one and phase two, but we want to be able to measure something that shows us that the drug has legs. And so um, oftentimes in early trials, we'll do something called enrichment, we'll, where we'll enrich for a certain population that we really think if we don't see that pharmacodynamic effect in those patients, then we'll know that you know, we should be a little concerned. But that oftentimes isn't a great strategy overall because you want your label to be least restrictive. And we often consider companion diagnostics. You really have to have your eye on that from the get-go. And these are things that might be coupled with your um, medication when it gets approved so that it picks out patients who might have an optimal response to that therapeutic. And just to um, explain a companion diagnostic, so one idea is for patients who are most likely to benefit. You can also use it to screen out patients who might be more prone to side effects and you can use it to monitor your patient's response to treatment. But you have to start this work early, and a diagnostic development really, hap it's coupled with every stage of drug development. And there's a lot of data from your clinical studies being fed into the diagnostics division as they do these assessments and develop that diagnostic. And um, so let's talk a little bit about phase one and phase two trials. And so phase one, um, so that's the primary objective is safety. And the first study we do is called a first in human or a single ascending dose study. And that's where patients get a single dose of the drug and you monitor them for a period of time. And this is showing you um, just an example of what that might look like. And in this example, we're moving from IV dosing to subcutaneous dosing. 
Um, and they're really small cohorts. This study, it's eight patients per cohort. So six are treated, two are placebo. And I'm gonna tell you, when you run a first in human and you know that your patients are gonna be dosed the next day, like you're, you don't sleep very well the night before. Even though you trust your, your calculations, you're still concerned. Like what if I hurt someone? What if something was wrong? Phase 1A, uh, the, you administer a dose, single dose, and you wait for an amount of time and you like assess for safety and PK. Um, the main goal is to evaluate safety and tolerability and it can be, um, depending on the type of drug, this can go pretty fast or it can go slowly. For a biologic, it can t you have to wait till a certain half-life of the drug. So they have a longer half-life, can be a month, a month or more. Um, and so the goal is to evaluate safety and tolerability to define what is the maximal dose. And you have to get to a certain dose level to enable repeat doses at a, at a level. You need exposure coverage. You want to characterize safety across a range of doses, PKPD relationships, proof of activity. Um, rarely it's clinical benefit, although in oncology trials, sometimes you get a little more information. Um, and you want to confirm or understand preclinical pre data. And this is not a powered trial. So sometimes we'll do these studies with really few patients in a cohort, maybe like three patients, four patients, and the, the drug in oncology. And sometimes people will come in and they'll be like, well, why don't we do more patients? You know, why don't we do 10 patients per cohort? And the reality is you're not gonna see something in 10 that you, most likely that you don't see in three. You might need to test 100 or right. you know, 1,000, which you're not gonna do in a phase one. And so again, as I mentioned, to move from your phase 1A to phase 1B, you really need to think about exposure coverage. And so we'll typically have to get to a certain dose level, which gives us an exposure so we can open up a, a repeat dose. So repeat dose um, where patients are getting doses over a number of days. And um, so the overall um, objective is to run these trials together so that you're not wasting time. You're not getting to what here would be 80 milligram sub Q. You are opening up five milligram sub Q as soon as you can. And you're kind of sequencing all the cohorts so you can run both studies at the same time. And so the multiple ascending dose study, it really impacts your phase two dose selection. And um, you really are considering um, what is the risk benefit um, so that you can understand how long to run those cohorts for? Is it, you know, for a biologic, typically we'll just do one dose, you know, three doses, but um, depending on the half-life, it's very often one dose every month or a dose every two weeks. Um, and you really wanna look at um, steady state PK, terminal PK, half-life, um, you really wanna determine that. And uh, you really wanna uh, elucidate PKPD, uh, relationships, activity of the drug, and any relationship of drug dosing with safety. And you wanna refine that therapeutic index. You really understand what is your range to test this drug. And so the success criteria for a phase one trial are that you, um, oops, just close that, <laughs> sorry. That you, um, you have target efficacious exposure, so you, you really understand, did you get that range that where you needed to examine PK? Is the drug getting to the right place? In terms of PD, is there evidence of biomarker modulation? Are there dose-dependent PD effects? That'll give you some sense that there's really an activity of your drug. Um, is the drug safe? Or if there were any safety issues identified, are they manageable and monitorable and mitigatable? Um, are there any lab data trends? Um, you know, is the drug tolerable? Compa is it, you know, when you, when you compare it to what might be competition at the time of launch, would this drug um, have be um, useful? And so what do you do next? And this gets into your question a little bit. And it's, there are many different things we can do. Most commonly, you'll do a phase 2A proof of activity or proof of concept trial. But sometimes it'll look a little different. It'll be a phase two, but it'll you know have some some special bells and whistles. Sometimes it'll be a flexible phase two three, where, where it's a phase two study that you might expand to be a phase three. Sometimes you'll just take that phase one data, which I've seen happen, and you'll just add patients. You make it into a phase three with FDA discussion. Um, it might be a good move. And sometimes you'll do multiple combinations of these in many different indications. It really depends on what your objective is. 
And, um, but let's talk about phase twos, which is the most common thing that I've seen happen. And this is really a gating study. Are you going to try to get that drug approved? And so the phase two A is a proof of activity or proof of concept. And um, that what I spoke about initially that most drugs fail is really a key here. And so the goal is to fail fast. You wanna make the decision as early as possible that you, know, you just need to abandon. Um, and uh, you, you oftentimes will run a trial which um, is structured a little differently from a drug approval trial. So it's typically not fully powered, usually powered only 80%. It may not have statistically valid um, endpoints or those endpoints that'll be approvable, as I mentioned, it might have surrogate endpoints. And it's, you don't wanna have a super huge trial that's this, the best scientific experiment possible. Oftentimes it's just enough data so that you can understand if it's worth moving forward. You might have a futility analysis. It may have an atypical design, like one is like when they were developing the COVID-19 vaccine, they, did, they were talking about doing challenge studies where you actually, it'd be a lot faster if you expose people to SARS-CoV-2 after you vaccinated them and see if it really helped them. Um, it may include more than one trial. Uh, the dosing strategy is gonna be very specific to the experiment. So you can have just a single dose study or you might have a range of doses or it might have a dose that changes, as you had mentioned. It really depends on what your goal is. And um, you might structure it in a way that'll inform a different indication as well. Um, and so for a small company, if you have positive results from your phase 2A, that's really key. It's an inflection point for that company. Um, and again, there's a lot of variability. So you might get proof of activity or concept in phase one, or you might not get it till later in development, depending on the, the drug you're developing. Um, but, and this is the hardest lesson for me to learn. So we sit in these rooms and we'll have the smartest people at Genentech um, kind of looking at the data we have and making the best decision. And it is the best decision from the available data, but it might not be the right decision when you have more data. And, um, that's always been a, been a bit of a challenge. Like we have a lot of bias to look for a positive, but we don't have the same bias to assume that there's no effect. Yeah, quick question, on the challenge studies you mentioned, um, do you run into a lot of like ethics issues there? Well, so they never did the challenge studies for the vaccine. Right. There was a guide on why you pushing for those, but I don't believe they ever did them in the US. But yeah, it depends. Sometimes we'll do challenge studies which aren't are that scary. So. We've um, done studies where we, we think our drug has a, an MOA that it, it can impact um, inflammation in the skin. Mm -hmm. So you can give an irritant to the skin mm -hmm. and just do a small study and see if that, if that irritation is reduced at all. Got it, got it. Okay. So that's not ethically sure, sure. Yeah. an issue. But yeah, but the, that's a great question that the COVID-19 work, mm -hmm. which probably would have sped vaccine development a little bit, yeah. was ultimately not done. Gotcha. Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah, no, great question. So what I'm gonna take you now through is some trial simulation data. So again, for those of you trained as scientists, the fact that we don't fully power our trials and the fact that patients are so heterogeneous. I was, in my first life, I was, uh, I was a bench scientist, right? I have these mice or rats, they all came from the same cage, they all look pretty similar. Humans are not like that, I found. When we enroll them in studies, they are so different. And the data you get is so, like, there's no explanation for the, the variability and who has what comorbidity. And so I'm gonna show you a trial simulation. And this is a publicly available simulation website, which is a lot of fun to play with. And so here's some trial simulation data, okay? So this, is, this study has a placebo group and it has five different dose ranges and 50 patients, that's a lot of patients. 50 patients have been tested. And what you're looking at, the dark blue dots are safety the lighter blue dots are efficacy. And this can be the data we get from a study. It's a little bit like reading tea leaves, right? So based on this data, which dose would you bring forward? You have, I can tell you have something to say, Colin. 60. He says 60, but look, we got one patient who had an issue there. 60, yeah, 60, 60, 60. Colin, do you agree? You're saying 60? Yeah, and so, you know, I don't know what's the right answer, but let's say, what if we test more doses? Let's say, okay, test another 50 patients. Let's fill in the, the rest of the groups. And this is the data we're seeing from the adjacent doses. 
All right, so looks like 40, 50, those patients aren't having a lot of efficacy, but you're doing much better higher. Maybe we want to dose at higher doses, right? To get away from the 40 to 50, I don't know. And so we'll sit in meetings looking at this and we'll be like, well, what do we do? So what if we double the, yeah? Right, so I mean, you have toxicity at 60, but not at 70. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. It, so you can throw that number away and just go to 100 and even higher. Yeah, and what's the problem with that? Like, so on the one hand, I'm, I might say, it's only one patient, right? Like, that's obviously, it was bad data. But what if, what if all the rest of this is bad data and that was only the only correct data, right? right? So we have these biases that we, we don't always look very fairly. So what if we double all, all the patients in each cohort? Do you think that's gonna be crystal clear? It's gonna be um, 20 patients over 10 groups. So we're gonna have 200 patients. Let's see. Is that any, is that any more helpful? And this is just a random simulation I, I ran there. And it's a, good. yeah, I mean, so what you see is you definitely have an effect with all of the doses over placebo, and you, but you have some safety signals. Um, so anyway, this is a lot of times what we're doing when we're moving forward. Um, does, and, it, does it depend upon what kind of safety? Yeah, that's on? exactly, that's, that's really important. Like if these are deaths, you know, we probably would be would think a little differently than if it's like a little skin rash. Right. Yep, that's a good point. And you know, I'd also like to do like, what's our bar? What is really the efficacy that's really going to benefit patients that we're trying to hit? Patient-specific adverse events that could be related. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, what is meant by the rate there? How is that? The, that's just the number observed, and so in efficacy. Uh, this is just a simulation, so they're not giving us any specific info, but I think you're on the right lines. Like, if this really were efficacy, we'd want to know, like, exactly what are we seeing? Like, and where does it fit in terms of our primary endpoint versus, versus what we want to see? So, like, zero for safety, that's the best. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but still, we don't know. What is that one? Is it a death? Is it a right. something more minor? Because it also will depend on, in a real world scenario, you may not have a patient population where everyone is exactly the same across the board. Some people might have the same stage of disease, but might be older, younger. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Some might smoke. Yeah. Others might have other issues. Yeah, there's so much heterogeneity that can explain some of what you see that has nothing to do with the activity of your drug or may, you know, sort of compl complicate things. How about if there's no other drug on the market for this indication? So, and that's when we get back to what the FDA is going to look at, that risk yeah. benefit. And so it might be worth it. Right. Yeah. It'll become compassionate use. Yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, with a phase two, a lot of times we're just trying to figure out, do we have efficacy? Is it safe enough to move forward to make that investment into um, a phase three trial? Let me see. And so... Um, Phase 2Bs, typically if we run a phase 2B, it's to confirm and to dose range. That's the overall goal. And so we'll look at a broader population or a wider, wider variety of, of doses. We, again, want to keep looking at the dose-response relationship, the therapeutic range, and identify any other variables that we need to consider for phase 3. Um, not all indications will share the same dose efficacy relationship. So a lot of times you'll evaluate what you see in terms of other indications. And in determining the next steps, um, you know, you really want to consider, were you able to establish the optimal dose? Um, how relevant is that patient population towards what you want to do long term? Um, and are the endpoints, uh, what are the endpoints for approval? And have the results been consistent across any test studies you've done? So what you could do next is you might do a phase 2A for another indication in concert with a phase two, three, or a fa you might do a phase three, or you might do multiple combinations of the, of the above, depending on what you saw and how strong the data was. Well, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, and ultimately, we're working towards approval. And so what is required for approval? Um, the gold standard is two adequate and well-controlled investigations. And so um, 
These two confirmatory trials are typically two phase threes. Sometimes it's a phase two and a phase three. Uh, and uh, in terms of evidence, they want to show statistically significant effect on a clinically meaningful endpoint. Um, and that's the basis for approval. And the endpoint has to have distinct and measurable characteristics of treatment outcome and improve how the patient feels and functions. And you pre-state exactly what you want to see in terms of what is your primary objective, and you weight your statistical um, analysis on those. And so you sort of are, uh, you come in with a very preset intent for, with your phase threes. And if you don't meet the mark, let's say you hit a secondary, but not your primary, you typically won't file on that drug. Um, and so these are called registrational trials when you do your phase threes. And um, things changed a lot. Uh, in the 1980s, it was taking the FDA two, three years to review some drugs filing packages. So they instituted something called PDUFA, Pardu Pharma Development User Fees Act. And um, it really shortened development timelines. And then there were a lot of other additions, like using expedited development, accelerated development. So it's not always two trials. Sometimes you do one good trial, and then you do a phase four trial to get approval. And so, how large? The trials, how, how large? Uh, it depends on your indication and um, the profile of the drug. But I've seen, um, you know, for like uh, a, a multiple sclerosis drug, it was two trials of I think 750 patients each. Right. I've seen for an IBD drug that they were required by the FDA to do a 3,000 to have a safety database of 3,000 patients, right. which is a huge trial. Um, I'm working in a space right now where we have two registrational trials, which I think are going to get up close, close to about 2,500 total patients. Yeah, so these are really large studies, but if it's a rare disease, it's going to be smaller. So uh, we had a rare disease come through recently, and I think there were just a little over 300 patients. Yeah. So in terms of the future, like I kept showing you that funnel that um, we have so many different candidates early, and then you know, one in 10 might ultimately make it. And so we have to figure out how to improve our success. And so you're probably are familiar with Moore's law and it's used a lot in computers that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles every two years, that you have gains from experience in production to increase computer power. Um, it's, the, it's not the same in drug development. So there's actually increasing time and cost for approval over time. So this red line is showing um, this cumulative data uh, of, of um, the cost and the numbers of annual launches. And this isn't really working, right? Drug prices are high. It still takes a lot of time to um, time and money to develop a drug for approval. And now we have a lot of drugs that we're trying to approve for rare diseases or smaller populations or personalized medicine. So it's a smaller subset of patients, but it still costs us the same amount to develop those drugs, even though it's for a much smaller um, population of patients. And so we talk a lot about bringing in a lot of computational power to improve drug development. And so this is that you know funnel I showed you where you go from um, basic research all the way through to doing your clinical development of a drug. And we have an idea of using it every step in this pathway, using machine learning and AI, and that's across the industry to try to improve it. So early on, can you pick the best target? And then when you have drug candidates, can you use AI and machine learning to pick your best um, uh, candidate, your lead molecule? Is there a way to you know, really predict which indications and how to move forward, and even in clinical trials, operationally, to use, use that to be more efficient um, and moving towards the end. And the overall goal is, is that by moving more quickly, having a higher success rate, we really might be able to decrease the cost to society of drug development and improve our success rate in being able to treat patients. And I think, and that's it, that's all I have for you. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. So for phase one and phase two, you tend to go back to the same clinical sites that you've used previously? It varies. And so a lot of times it depends on what other trials they're running, those uh, clinical sites, so how and busy how busy they are, and what kind of trials they're comfortable running. So phase one trials have a lot more um, 
patient interaction in terms of blood draws, because you're doing a lot of PK and there's a lot more typical patients in the clinic. Sometimes you need patients to stay in the clinic for a few days. Right. And it really depends on what sites can manage that. Whereas in a phase two, it can be a little more lean. Right. Yeah, and they can go home. You have, you've shown the safety profile, so they can go home. So it varies, it's a great question. Yeah, some PIs only do phase threes, that's right. it. Yeah. So what is the good predictor from animal study to have a successful clinical study? That's a great question. And uh, if we knew that, right? <laughs> so a, a lot of times, um, yeah, we what we try to do in preclinical is also have some clinical data, whether it be patient samples or a claims database work or some something we can do that gives us a little more confidence that we're going to see it in the clinic. So um, a lot of times what we do is um, data from all of our clinical trials gets fed back into basic research. Most companies do this. And so they use those samples to mine for other targets. And you know you can say that's a better way to go. It may be. Um, so at least you have some human data. And then you model it in an animal. If, but oftentimes you don't have the right animal model. But you'll try that. Sarah, what, what is your thought uh, on uh, outsourcing clinical trial to foreign countries? Yeah. Given that we have a few clients that may be listening that they are in Europe or Asia. Yeah. What is your thought? So uh, we, what, what do you need to worry about? Yeah, so we do global trials mostly, which means we're working with you know vendors at all levels. Um, and investigator clinical sites that are all over the world. And it's important for us to do that. So um, it's actually one of the most important things to do to get diversity, genetic diversity um, and all of that. So yeah, as much as possible, we do it. And it's become clear that um, I think we need to realize that it's much more feasible than we assumed. Uh, during co during um, the COVID pandemic, a lot of companies started going out to community clinics. They realized they were only testing a certain segment of the population, and they realized they could go to these rural clinics and actually run clinical trials. Um, so I think that's a great learning. My other question is that these uh, companion diagnostics, are they being uh, sort of welcomed from a pharma industry point of view, or are they being forced upon them by the FDA? Oh, and I see. Because, yeah. you know, it's like uh, in the old days, you created a drug, millions of people took it, company, yeah. pharma, pharma industry made a lot of yeah. money. Now, if you're going to only limit, say, Lipitor to only so many yeah. people, then their sales will go down. Yeah, I think what we're facing, though, is, you know, you name drugs that are blockbuster drugs, right? And what if there are no more blockbuster drugs? What do you do? And you might need a companion diagnostic. So if you're developing a personalized medicine or for a rare disease, so rare diseases might not need a companion diagnostic, but what, I'm, what I've seen are a lot of tumor agnostic drugs, right? And so you're definitely going to need a diagnostic um, because it's not just, well, if you have a lung tumor, you most likely will get that, but you need that specific mutation. But you could also have that um, tumor in your thyroid or in your pancreas. So I think that um, the FDA isn't putting the pressure for companion diagnostics. I think that's just the space where there's room. Unless you have a very novel mo therapeutic modality, that's just sort of where we're, where we're stuck. Yeah, it's a great question though. It's We get very concerned. That's a lot of this is, well, if there are no more blockbusters and it costs the same amount to develop these niche drugs, like we, it's just not tenable. You're going the opposite of Moore's Law. Yeah, yeah, that's why they call that. I don't know if I spelled that out. They call it E-Room's Law. They moved it, they changed the letters to make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other thing that it's always uh, challenging is inclusion exclusion criteria. Yeah. If you ex exclude, you know, so many people, you know, in some, you know, in, let's say uh, some clinical studies that you really are targeting, you want to succeed, but then you're limiting your patient pool to so little. A, it's hard to enroll patients. B you're going to be living. Your label's going to have, your label's going to say that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we're always trying to get the least restrictive label, but in phase ones, we often have eligibility that are the most conservative, uh, and that's really so we can understand the safety profile. So we might have to say patients with certain drugs, they can't, because if the, like for their trial I'm running, we have two drugs that patients tend to take that cause a lot of gastrointestinal side effects. They lose weight, they have chronic diarrhea, and unfortunately, if they take these drugs in our trial, we won't know if our drug is doing that or their medication, and it might, uh, might complicate. So we really wanna understand the safety profile so we can, so yeah, but then later on, we'll enroll those patients once we understand it. But yeah, in, uh, in a phase ones, we often, if it's in patients, you often want like healthy sick patients, which is a very difficult population to find at times. What kind of adverse effects do you see? It, so it varies. It depends on the drug's mechanism of action. But yeah. like I was mentioning to you before, like a T-cell engager, you can see cytokine release syndrome, which is basically that um, you'll just see a lot of cells um, bursting. You'll see this huge cytokine response in the blood. And yeah. it's, it's like patients will look profoundly ill and they can die from it, right? Um, but sometimes it's more minor. Like you'll see, if it's an injectable drug, you'll see some redness on the skin. Um, sometimes you'll see patients report they're fatigued or dizzy. And so it's, it's a little more vague. But yeah, it really varies based on your drug. And what we typically do is try to, under, try to predict what AEs we're gonna see. And we look for those specifically. Um, but then you'll have meetings, uh, routine meetings to review all the safety data. And you'll have clinicians just really going through everything, all the lab values, all the assessments, and then any AEs, and really trying to understand what's, you know, what, what, is, uh, what is the risk level and how can we work on it? Kind of parse true side effect versus, you know, someone thinking, you know, if it's a double blind yeah, we, experiment, they might think, oh, I've got the drug, and yeah. so I think I have all these effects. Yeah. That's really just the placebo effect. Yeah. They're mentally making themselves better, but yeah. you parse that out. Yeah, so it depends on the study, but we, you know, we have to treat all data like it's real. And so when I'm on the study as a clinical scientist, I go into the database and I, have no idea who's gotten what. And my job is to do what's called medical data review. We also call it data cleaning. And I have to look at every adverse event and ask questions, you know, for that uh, un try to understand causality and try to make sure the narrative makes sense. So the patient had a broken tooth, you know, and to ask questions. Well, did the patient previously have dental work on that tooth or had they reported issues when they started the trial? Um, it, are they healing from their you know, the procedure that was done on the tooth. Um, are there any ongoing other issues with other teeth in their mouth? So like, I'll ask all of those questions to try to, it's like being a detective. Like I wanna collect enough information so that we can really understand that AE. In terms of efficacy, it's tough. So a, lo a lot of the physicians we work with are just amazing people that wanna see their patients do better. And so if the endpoint's a little bit subjective, you really worry that they want to see benefit in their patients. And so you always try to work in some endpoints that are um, the patients report how they're feeling, the physicians, you have some endpoints that are less subjective and you try to just really be open-minded about it. Again, like when we were looking at the trial simulated data, the tendency is to see any trend and, oh, our drug has an effect because that, well, that's what we were going for. But it also might be that the physicians are just, uh, they're just desperate to see it, something in their patients. So yeah, we always try to stay very level. It's a, it's a brain game to look at that data time. Sometimes it's very clear. Other times it's, you know, you don't want to get too excited too soon. Well, how do you blind uh, things? Do you have any uh, blinding stories? Or yeah. In ophthalmology, they don't like to call it blinding. They call it masking. <laughs> masking, yes, yes. <laughs> So we, we, um, we do mask a lot, um, or blind. And so um, typically the pharmacist is the only one who may have insight, but we try to keep them blinded. Whoever administers the drug is always blinded. Um, if there are issues, like you can tell a little bit in the vial that it's a different drug, you'll often you know, put, use a darker colored glass on the vial. You'll choose the syringe gauge so that you can't feel any change in viscosity. Um, so you'll have very strict rules so that nobody can tell what's what because if a physician or whoever's monitoring the patient is convinced that the patient got the drug, 
they'll they might report things that are you know so you really and even for me like i always try to maintain my blind i'm in a study now where um patients have three months of of uh, phase 1b and then they all go into open label so i know everybody will get the treatment in open label but i've been very clear i want to keep my blind through the whole study because i'm afraid once if i'm unblinded in the open label i'll start to want to see things in certain people yeah and, and my last question i'm asking a lot of questions and uh, any other questions? Oh, no, oh. oh, I was going to say, um, earlier there in the presentation, you said that the average cost starts to finish about $3 billion. Yeah. Is there like, well, I mean, with that such a high price, is there like a minimum amount of people that have to be suffering from the disease to even... So that's start? a great question. And so we're kind of crossing that threshold where we're trying to figure out how to make those investments. A big company can spend that money, sure. but small companies can't, right? So you oftentimes will partner up to try it if we feel like that drug's important. But if it's only gonna help like 10 people, is there that? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it depends on if it's only going to help 10 people, you probably it wouldn't cost that much because you couldn't do a super huge trial. So there's a few okay. drugs nowadays that are they're called like N of one drugs. Like there was a girl with a very rare set of mutations and they developed a drug specifically for her gotcha. and they but they had to get FDA approval to give it right. to her still. So, yeah, I think it, it changes a little bit based on, you know, like in a rare disease, you're gonna have smaller trials. So it'll be a little cheaper. But then again, like I have I have a study in rare patients where we have to go, we're in almost 50 sites. We want to get um, at minimum 30 patients. We have 50 clinical trial sites, right. which is a bit crazy. And in that case with that one person, like who pays for that? Um, and that's great. And I think they ended up with, um, they might have gotten a grant or something okay. to, so it was part of like a research. It was oh, university okay. and it was a university who developed right. it. Yeah, but I'm not sure. It was written up. It was a the patient was a girl named Mila who had a neurodegenerative disorder. She didn't, she died, but they thought they saw a little benefit. It was just took them so long to develop it for her, and they thought they saw a little benefit, but it was probably too late. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Brianna or. How long would your shortest clinical trial from start to finish? Yeah, so I saw one drug, and it's because there was a lot of in-house experience, it was part of a franchise, I saw one drug move really quickly, probably um, seven years, six, seven years, from phase one to approval. Yeah, but it, you really need like something to be able to move that quickly. Yeah, it's not always, but then you know, look, at it, look at the vaccine development, that was 11 months. Yeah, but what they did was they like they did everything at risk. So they while they were doing the phase one, they started the phase two, and then they, you know, and vaccines are a little different to develop. But yeah. So and what it says you guys do the drug drug interaction study? Oh, drug drug interaction. So we uh, that's really great. So I think that's done much more with small molecules, which I have less experience in. But yeah, that's part of the phase one. Well, you'll you'll do some uh, food effect cohort and some drug drug interaction analysis. But I've never done those actually. Yeah, but what we do in for large molecules, we typically they run it in a in some sort of computer system where it'll pick out all the drugs they're concerned about our drug interacting with, like similar proteins to our target. What kind of placebo effects have you seen that is absolutely astounding for you? Yeah, so it's a great question. <laughs> there are studies that sometimes the data is all over the place, so it's hard for me to say. But um, I'm very curious about a study I'm running now. Like I mentioned, the physicians who really want to see benefit. And I was at a meet. I was at meetings in Italy at the end of May, and three different physicians came to me and said they see such changes in their patients. And so that's not placebo effect, but that's, you know, somebody might be very excited by that. Like, oh my God, our drug is the miracle drug. But when I heard the first guy was like, oh, that's interesting. The second one, I got a little scared because I was like, oh no, the, this is the phenotype. These physicians who really are desperate to help their patients, which they're wonderful physicians, I'm going to say. I mean, if it's geographically isolated, it could also be that subpopulation for whatever genetic reasons yeah. they're just more yeah, like they have better response to they're it. better yeah so it might that might be it or it could be um yeah I, at the end you just try to 
kind of keep an even keel and wait till you see the They're data. Not great pro for the Italian market. Yeah. So a lot of times you'll build your studies with multiple data points that will all, if you see everything, all the switches tripped, you'll be like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. That's uh, interpretable. So for maps, how long did they stay in circulation in your body? Yeah, so it depends. Each They have different half-lives based on um, the antibody, what else it might bind in its FC region. And so, um, and sometimes now we actually design them so they get recycled. So when they, right. if they get taken in, they can get re-released. Um, the ones I've worked on are typically 21 to 28 days is the half-life. So yeah, maybe, right. maybe six to eight weeks. Yeah. yeah. It's a long time. It's, it's nice in terms of patient burden, especially if it can be a subcutaneous drug that they don't have to go to the clinic. Um, and some of them, like um, the multiple sclerosis treatment they have now, which is an anti-CD20 antibody, they only have to get two doses a year. Yeah, which is phenomenal. Um, yeah, except that they have to go and get an infusion twice a year, but um, it's, at least it's not monthly. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Again. Yeah, thank you.